Assalamu alaikum, everyone. This is Salam al Mariyadi with the Muslim Public Affairs Council. I'm really honored and pleased to be joined by Cenk Uger, who is a Democratic presidential candidate and also founder of the Young Turks, one of the largest social media platforms that we that we find today. I, every time I go on YouTube, there are hundreds of thousands, if not over a million uh, views uh, on the, the discussions that he has. And he also makes the rounds with uh, all the the social media influencers, and sometimes makes it to broadcast media uh, and uh, and always does a great job. Uh, he's also founder of uh, Justice Democrats. Uh, so, Cenk, tell us a little bit about uh, all the things that you've been doing. Yeah, so I'm really proud of the work that we did with Justice Democrats. That's the group that helped to get uh, AOC, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, and Ayanna Presley elected. That was our first time around. And at the time, uh, you know, when we said we're running Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez against Joe Crowley, who was in Democratic leadership and was slated to take over for Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House, uh, people thought we were crazy. They said, that's impossible. And then you're going to get a couple of Muslim women elected in the middle of the country. All of these things they said were impossible. And uh, it turns out they weren't. And we set up the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. There's now 11 just Democrats in Congress. So all things are possible. Uh, you just have to try really hard to do them. You have to have a good strategy and the and the effort behind it to make sure that it comes to fruition. And by the way, Salam, same uh, thing goes for Young Turks. When we started it 22 years ago, and I, I started it in my uh, living room in a one-bedroom apartment with almost no money at all, no connections, no nothing, people said, well, that's impossible. You can't get that up off the ground. Well, right now, we're the largest online news network there is, period. And we've had over 25 billion views. We have 27 million subscribers across a dozen platforms. So, you know, whether it's our community or any community, I just want people to realize that when somebody tells you that something's impossible, it's usually because they don't want you to try. Uh, have a great plan. Make sure you work really hard. But if you try, there's a lot you can accomplish. Isn't it strange that we have to have a progressive wing of the Democratic Party? Where has the Democratic Party gone uh, from the days of uh, FDR, uh, where he laid down the four freedoms of human security, freedom of worship, freedom of expression, freedom from fear, freedom from want. Uh, and now we're dealing with a Democratic Party that is sometimes I feel like it's just competing too much to be Republican like. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Look, normally I don't mention this during the campaign, but I mean, what you just said there is the very heart of uh, chapter four of the book that I wrote recently called Justice is Coming. And uh, I, that's where I explain how the Democrats are no longer the party of FDR. Like the Republicans are no longer the party of Lincoln. That's, you know, absurd for them to claim that. Uh, Lincoln helped uh, the cause of civil rights and equality, obviously, and the Republicans now stand against that, unfortunately. Uh, but for the Democrats, uh, you know, people don't recognize the change that they went under uh, as much as they should. And and I explain that in my book because it's so critical to everything that happens in politics. We lost the Democratic Party because of corporate donations. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce launched a plan to take over the Supreme Court. And it's in a public memo. It's the most famous political memo of all time. It's called the Powell Memo. And, and I explain all the different parts of it and, and how they executed it perfectly. And they took over the courts. The courts basically legalized bribery in America. So we now try to compete with grassroots donors and a lot of uh, small donations from tons of good folks. And we can. And we do win. We we have one with Rashida and Ilhan and, and Bernie Sanders and AOC with grassroots donations. But we're up against a machine of gigantic corporate donations. And unfortunately, it hasn't just taken over the Republican Party. It took over the Democratic Party. And so now the Bidens of the world serve that. That's their new, you know, God. And so if the defense contractors and the oil companies and APAC all want war, they're going to get war. And it doesn't matter how much the American people are opposed to it. Um, before we get to the, the topic of uh, of war, um, the, the issue of Joe Biden, I mean, they talk a lot about the gun lobby and how it's ruined uh, our, our political process. They do, I be believe, try to discuss uh, uh, campaign reform. Uh, but but APAC is doing just as much, if not worse, than uh, the gun lobby. And I believe AOC said that 
APAC is an extremist group. It is a threat to our democracy. Can you speak to that? Yeah, of course. So first of all, look, Joe Biden, unfortunately, every once in a while talks a good game, although he mainly doesn't talk. But when he does talk, uh, he pretends to really believe in the old school Democratic agenda, the FDR agenda that you alluded to. But does he actually carry out anything? No. So what has he done on campaign finance reform? Absolutely nothing. Why? Because he's the biggest recipient of corporate campaign contributions in the whole country. Even Trump doesn't get as much corporate cash as Joe Biden does. So he's not going to do anything about it. And so all he does is pay lip service to it. Uh, co corruption is running rampant. So look, all of these politicians are bought. Let, let's be honest here. Let's have a frank conversation that they never have in the media. So if they're taking corporate cash, they serve corporate cash and they serve lobbyists. So saying anything else is absurd. And if you ask, if you ask people in D.C., they're outraged by that idea. No, these are very honorable people. They're the most honorable people among us, these beloved politicians. You ask real Americans, you ask all the voters, and they're like, are you kidding? Of course they're corrupt. So if a company gives, if ExxonMobil or Coke or Nike or any company, whether they're a good company, bad company, doesn't really matter. If they give a million dollars to a politician, are, are they going to buy the politician? Of course, of course they're going to buy the politician. Every real person knows that. This is just flat out legalized bribery. And Joe Biden hasn't done anything about it. He had a plan on voting rights that we loved. What did he do? He threw it under the bus immediately, did nothing. Let Joe Manchin, Chris and Sinema kill it because he didn't, never really meant it. They don't want reform. Part of that voting rights reform was ending gerrymandering, which is the heart of corruption. Look, on our website, Salam, jankforamerica.com, I explain all the ways that Joe Biden is going to lose, whether we like him or don't, right? There's just no question about that. If you want, we could talk more about that. But the polling is an absolute disaster. He would have to literally pull off the biggest political comeback in American history. Does he look like he's capable of that? He looks like he's barely capable of walking and talking at the same time. So... But the second thing that we mentioned is our policies, whether it's ending war, it's campaign finance reform. And on gerrymandering, 90% of Americans don't want these districts gerrymandered because basically that's the politicians picking their voters instead of the voters picking the politicians. Now, that was in the Voting Rights Act that uh, that Biden claimed to be in favor of. But the minute the they ran into the filibuster, Biden's like, I don't care. No, I I, I prefer the filibuster to voting rights. But the filibuster is not in the Constitution. The filibuster is historically used to suppress civil rights. So it's not a great tradition of the Senate. It's a terrible, horrific tradition of the Senate meant to suppress our rights. And Joe Biden participated in that. And so that's among the reasons I'm running against him. He's a disaster on all of these policy issues. And, and yes, is he controlled by the people who give him money, just like every other politician that takes corporate cash? Absolutely. If that offends you, that means the truth offends you. You know, there are some presidents that make war so they can become more electable. It seems that the more Joe Biden dives into this war, which is not a war, it's an assault. It's committing atrocities against civilian populations in Gaza. The more he's doing that, the more he's losing support. So he's becoming almost like an LBJ before technically uh, announcing uh, a war where uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson actually decided not to run for president uh, for the 68 elections because of the civil strife due to the Vietnam War. Is that what Joe Biden is in right now? Is that the, the, the dilemma he's in at this point? 100%. So let me explain two parts of that. So look, I, I'm trying to, for the, either the Eugene McCarthy role or the, or the, if I'm lucky and uh, enough the Robert Kennedy role and unlucky too. Of course, we don't want it to end as as that did. And but uh, look, they were right. Uh, LBJ was uh, basically a wounded animal at that point politically, and he was going to lose the general election. And when McCarthy did so well in New Hampshire, he realized my time is up. I I'm going to get embarrassed here, and I got to get out. And McCarthy didn't wind up winning, but obviously RFK was going to win. He wasn't just going to win the nomination, uh, which he had locked up at that point, but he was going to win the general election, and that's why they assassinated him. And so, uh, and, you know, of course I don't buy the official explanation of who killed RFK. That's absurd. Uh, so, 
But now, having said all that, uh, Biden is so stubborn. And even though he's at 33 percent in, in the approval rating, no incumbent in an election year that has been anywhere near the 30s, even if he was at 39 percent, has ever come back to win an election ever in American history. And not just for president, for any federal office. The idea that this guy who barely campaigns is going to pull off a 19 point comeback. He was 19 points higher when he barely beat Trump in the electoral college. It's absurd. So go to jankforamerica.com, see all the numbers, see all the policies. There's no question he's going to lose. He is such an egomaniac. And he says, I don't care if the Democratic Party loses. I don't care if we lose democracy. I don't care about any of it. I want a second term because a second term pre uh, president is cooler than a one term president. It's absurd. It's horrific what he's doing in this country. But on the policy now, especially with this, the massacres in Gaza, he's arguably even worse. So when it comes to politics, he was already a disaster. Now, on the policy of Gaza, there's a story out today about how Joe Biden is pleading, and that's the word they use, with Benjamin Netanyahu uh, to do less bombings, massacre less Palestinians. Not don't massacre Palestinians, mm -hmm. don't do bombing, stop what you're doing. He's just pleading with them, can you have a little less massacres? And Netanyahu blew him off and said, who the hell are you? No, my answer is an unequivocal no. And you can go and look at it in the papers. They explain exactly what happened. So wait, who's running the show here? And look, let's assume, like, can, if you assume that Joe Biden is earnest about his approach here, number one, that means he's monstrous. He's willing to uh, go along with war crimes. There's no war. All Israel has obliterated Gaza. Does it look like they have the capacity to fight back? They always talk about Israel has a right to defend itself. Okay, how about the Palestinians? Do they have a right to defend themselves? So the, the atrocities are through the roof. And Biden's saying, just give me 80% atrocities instead of 100% atrocities. That's terrible on its own. Number two, is he so unaware of politics after being in politics for approximately 200 years that he doesn't know that pleading with a foreign leader is not how you do politics or policy? No, you draw a line. And you say, if you cross this line, there are going to be consequences. To, ha to have the president of the United States begging the prime minister of Israel it's just pathetic, totally, utterly pathetic. And in that case, you don't have to, it isn't even about whether you think Israel's right or Palestine, Palestinians are right, although I don't know how that's a hard question. But it's about our president demeaning himself and humiliating himself to a foreign leader, begging him, getting rejected, slapped across the face, and doing absolutely nothing about it. Who can countenance a person in not only this craven, but also this weak, weak, pleading with Netanyahu. So what would I do different? Well, I, it, easy. Uh, number one, you're going to uh, end this entire nonsense. You've killed 20 times the number of innocent civilians that Hamas did. So if Hamas are terrorists, I guess that makes you 20 times the terrorist. Is, is killing innocent civilians terrorism or isn't it? So this wordplay that they do where they say, no, as our allies get to murder civilians endlessly, but since they're state actors, that's not terrorism. But if you kill one civilian of ours, that's it, you're a terrorist. Come on, nonsense, total nonsense. Yes, there is state terrorism. Yes, that's what Israel is doing now. Yes, it's 20 times worse. It's an empirical. It's, a, it's just a number. It's a fact. So number one, you're going to end all of it. Number two, you're going to end occupation. If you don't do that, America will send you nothing, absolutely zero dollars to Israel. Why would I want to send not only my taxpayer dollars, but hardworking Americans, blue collar guys in the middle of the country that go report to steel mills, auto companies, et cetera, union guys trying to put food on the table. Are you going to take money out of their pockets to go kill Palestinians? No, you're not. To occupy them and imprison them. for They've already done it for 75 years. What, another 75 years? No way. No way. As long as you have Palestinians as prisoners, which is what the occupation is, America should send Israel absolutely zero dollars. And if you think it's not possible, that's the same thing they said when I started Young Turks. That's the same thing I, they said when I started Justice Democrats. And you know why I know it's possible? Look at the polling. Over two thirds of Americans say ceasefire immediately. 
If I went to them and said, hey, do you guys want the money or should we send it to Israel to butcher more Palestinians? That poll would be at 90%, okay? It's just that the politicians in America, until someone like me comes along, they don't work for the average American. They they work for their donors, and it's super obvious. And look, one last thing about the question you asked. The reason Biden was begging uh, Netanyahu is because he's lost Michigan, and he and he knows he's lost the race. He's 10 points down in Michigan, but to be fair, he's down in every swing state. And, and part of the reason is it's not just Arab Americans or Muslim Americans that are now saying they're not going to vote for Joe Biden. It's the young. He's lost the young completely. And Gaza is a gigantic part of that. Uh, every young person I talk to, and we uh, interact with tons and tons of young people because we're an online network. And they all say, if you're going to send money to butcher people, we're out. No way. We're not voting for that. Under no circumstances are we going to vote for war crimes and genocide. It's not going to happen, right? So now he's losing young people by four. No Democrat who loses young people can has any chance, literally a 0% chance of winning a national election. These guys are kidding themselves. These things are already over unless the Democrats get another candidate. So he's losing every swing state. That's why he's going saying to Netanyahu, please, can you save my career? I mean, his own career is on the line and he's still asking for permission from Netanyahu. It's ridiculous and disgusting. Yeah, I mean, just some f fundamental principles. You don't allow a foreign leader to dictate on the president of the United States, our commander in chief, and he is being uh, told what to do uh, in terms of military and uh, 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 activities in in, uh, in another front halfway across the world. Um, it's, I mean, to me as an American, I'm I'm disgusted by that. I also know a lot of Jewish leaders that I work with, and even though they can't come out publicly call for a ceasefire, their kids are demonstrating uh, for Palestine. So he's he's losing all youth across the board, whether you're black or white, Jew or Muslim or or Christian or Hindu, Buddhist, whatever. He's using he's losing the youth, so it it doesn't look good uh, for for Joe Biden uh, in 2024. Um, in terms of what's happening in the Middle East, then there are military experts that say that we are on the brink of a regional war if it hasn't started already. I mean, there are skirmishes. We're going to call it skirmishes in Iraq. Uh, there there have been uh, attacks in Lebanon and in Syria. Um, where do where, where do you see this going in terms of expanding to uh, a larger a larger front and actually fighting many fronts in the region? Yeah. So let, let me go back and, and comment on two things you said, and then I'll c come back to the wider war in one second. So uh, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, I wish they did a poll of younger Jewish voters because Jewish voters are generally the uh, other than African Americans the most progressive voters in the country. And uh, and anecdotally, you you see younger Jewish uh, uh, Americans totally on our side, because just like you said, this isn't about being Jewish or Palestinian or anything else. Uh, this is about humanity and doing the right thing. So when Iraq, when America went into Iraq, we criticized America. Why? Because we hate America? No, we, because we love America, and we wanted to make sure that it didn't do the wrong thing. And unfortunately, we did do the wrong thing there. And so. And so when younger uh, Jewish Americans criticize Israel for this, they're not doing it because they hate Israel. They're doing it because they love Israel and they don't want Israel to be participating in war crimes. They don't want Israel to be an international pariah hated by the world because they keep Palestinians uh, imprisoned and, and kill them at, at a moment's notice. So this is this is beyond religion. This is not beyond ethnicities and, and, and tribalism. This is about people doing the right thing. And in terms of of our leaders, look, remember when the Democrats were irate because they thought Trump was being controlled by the Russians? So that's a, a foreign country controlling our president. And right. then also there was charges in regards to Trump being controlled by Erdogan in Turkey, by the Saudis, because the Saudis were pumping so much money into him. And those are all terrible. And we all agreed they were terrible. But when Biden is controlled by not just Israel, but also Saudi Arabia, he did an ultimatum to Saudi Arabia, and the Saudis said, you're a joke. We're not going to listen to a thing you say. <laughs> and he had to go oh, sheepishly say, okay, sorry, sorry, and walk out of the room. So this is just weakness, and it's not what America should stand for. Now, in terms of the wars, 
Look, Netanyahu and his right-wing government have said this exceedingly clearly. They want a wider war. They've uh, bombed Lebanon a number of times already, and they want to drag America into a war with Iran. Netanyahu has said it dozens and dozens of times. He gave, he came to America and gave a speech to Congress saying, I want you to start a war with Iran on my behalf. And then he's going to go and tuck tail and run. He's not going to fight it. He wants America to fight it. My answer to that is, hell no. That is a disaster. Iran is four times the size of Iraq. That they don't have any idea who they're what they're messing with here. So is it does America have a bigger military? Of course we do. Could we quote unquote beat Iran? Well, what does beating Iran mean? Right. I mean, we we'd have to kill millions of people. It would be a, a mess beyond imagination. And then what do we win? What do we win? Do we win a democracy? Do you think do we think bombing Iran would make them more moderate and secular or more, more fanatical and fundamentalist? That's not an open question. Everybody knows it would make them more radical, not less radical. So these people don't, you don't even have a plan. So what are you going to do now? You got the Houthis that are bombing the shipping lanes of ships that are specifically going to Israel. We struck back and it's called Operation Prosperity Guardian. You know what that means? They're like, yeah, this, this sh going around the uh, Horn of Africa is costing, literally, this is on CNBC, costing us 10% extra for all the freight. Since the Houthis are costing us 10% of our profits of anything going to Israel, we're going to kill them. This is what America is doing now with its military. And mm -hmm. this is supposed to be a Department of Defense. A Department of Defense, by the way, they can't account for half the money that we send them. They fail every audit and go, oops, we can't find $400 billion. God knows where that money is. So now they're going to fight the Houthis in Yemen, the Hezbollah, and maybe the governor of, of Lebanon. And you're going to start a broader war with Iran. This is just total insanity. It would be a disaster for the Middle East, for humanity, but also a disaster for America. So if you had someone like me in charge, I would never countenance it. it there's no chance that would happen. But with Biden, we're walking straight into it. I'll say one last thing about it. What happened to the deal with Iran? Oh, Barack Obama made a perfectly good deal with Iran. We took uranium out of Iran so they could not possibly get nukes. We accomplished exactly what our goal was. Trump, like a corrupt idiot that he is, took us out of that deal. Joe Biden, why don't you just put us back in? It was part of your administration. You made the deal along with Barack Obama. Why don't you just put us back in on day one? Nope, he didn't. He followed the Trump policy, and the Trump policy is going to lead to war, and here we are. Yeah. It's a shame, and it's a shame that the United States now has to be dragged into this. And you know, going to war. I mean, it's not just Iran. I mean, I I believe that every Muslim in that region, 1.5 billion or more, is is feeling targeted right now. So we are getting, we're gaining the animosity of 1.5 billion people. What kind of foreign policy is that? And if you just called for a ceasefire, and there was a ceasefire, you would get more hostages released. You would then develop a uh, political. Uh, uh, discussions about what to do uh, with the Palestinians and the Israelis. You would then negotiate with the Lebanese in terms of what's happening along that front uh, with Israel and so on and so forth. It it doesn't make any sense to continue to, to war from an American interest standpoint. If you just looked at American interest, it makes no, there's no strategic value at all. If anything, it, it is putting America, uh, putting more Americans in harm's way. And I think Total responsibility now is going to be at the feet of Blinken and, and Biden for what happens after this. Well, look, to be fair to Blinken, uh, Biden, and Netanyahu, uh, you know, I talked about doing the impossible earlier. Well, they might be doing the impossible, which is getting the Sunni and the Shia together. Uh, and so, look, we're already they, together they've here united in America. The, they, they've united the people. That's right. <laughs> we're already here uh, together here in America. We're united in, in secular groups and loving uh, peaceful religious groups but there are you know obviously factions in the middle east with the sunni and the shia that that are not fond of one another to say the least and right. but now they're united uh and and they're and to your point about 1.5 billion muslims look turkey had a complicated reaction to october 7th and then after the Is israeli bombing started the entire population of turkey said no that's it no support the palestinians uh this is it's unacceptable we see our Muslim brothers and sisters being pulled up uh, body part by body part out of the rubble. We can't we can't stand it. We can't stomach it. 
So they have united disparate forces within the Muslim world that usually do not work together into a coalition that is united saying, stop killing them. We can all see it with our own eyes. We can hear it with our ears. We can hear their screams. Please stop butchering them. And so if they start a broader war, I mean, already 23,000 at least dead in Gaza, but you saw nearly a million dead in Iraq. How many are they going to kill in a war with Iran, Yemen, Lebanon, and God knows what else? No, this it's it's apocalyptic, and yeah. we've got to change course immediately. You know, it's amazing. You know, people and groups like, like yours and ours have been advising every administration, don't go to war in, in Iraq. Don't bomb uh, over there. Don't don't support the uh, annihilation of the uh, Yemeni people. Uh, don't allow the destruction of the Palestinians. And and they, in their arrogance, claim that they know better. They know what they're doing. And this is about America's interest and, and, and so on and so forth. They've been wrong every time. And we've been right every time. And I think it's about time that that uh, uh, that things change and they put people uh, from uh, our community in administration in the administration to advise them on that. I don't think there's a single uh, person from our community that is, is at a high level policy making position in the State Department or the National Security Council. They have they have completely blocked any kind of, of advice from our community. I mean, there are analysts and there you know assistants to the secretaries of 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 various groups and assistant to the national security advisor, uh, but nobody at a policy making position. And I think that's been the case, I believe, since the 1950s when they cleansed out all the people that they consider quote unquote Arabists. Yeah. And Rumsfeld did it again uh, right before the Iraq war. He fired everyone that he considered quote an Arab apologist. So the idiot fired everyone who could speak Arabic. And so it was a mess afterwards, after the invasion, because they literally didn't know how to communicate, whether yeah. it was to allies or to anyone else there. So, look, they, I, I don't have to belabor the anti-Arab, anti-Muslim um, uh, nature of the American government, unfortunately, for a long, long time. Uh, everybody's aware of that. And what are the, what's the first thing they did uh, as soon as this the hostilities and the conflict broke out? take the one Palestinian voice in Congress and censure her. So no no Palestinian voice is allowed, no Muslim voice is allowed, and this is a democracy. Well, look, here's what people need to understand. We're Americans too, and we're citizens, and we can vote any way we like, and this whole badgering us, no, 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 the other side is worse. Well, look, I think it, they are. I think Trump is a monster, but you're not doing yourself any favors by saying I'm 98% as bad as him. So now you're forced to vote for me. Now we're not forced to do anything. 100% American, we can do anything we like and we could exercise any decision and vote for anyone or not vote for anyone we want. And, and Muslim Americans are a significant percentage of America now. And if they rise up, I think they can make a giant difference in terms of policy. Basically, on Michigan alone, they can say, thou shall not pass if you don't have the right policies. And that doesn't mean ones that are only pro-Arab or pro-Muslim. Dare to dream, right? But, but one that just says, no, 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 not pro-anything, just pro-humanity. Stop killing innocent civilians. Yes. If they say that in Michigan, let alone all across the country— that basically means no one gets to be elected president unless you sign some off to the idea that all human beings are equal, they're the same, and their lives are worth the same, not based on identity or religion. What a fantastic idea, human equality. Um, hey, the, the last thing I want to ask you about is uh, the, the convention, the Democratic National Convention coming up this summer. Uh, the last time I believe a convention was in Chicago was 1968 uh, during the Vietnam War. And you mentioned Eugene McCarthy, who was uh, speaking out against the war. RFK had a vision beyond Vietnam. Uh, uh, you are coming in uh, uh, along that same trajectory. Um, what do you see happening in this uh, in this convention if Joe Biden remains as the candidate for the Democratic Party, as the incumbent candidate, and he's not going to step down? 
Uh, what do you see in terms of what's going to happen on the floor? Because I imagine, as you mentioned, you know, there's going to be a lot of progressives, a lot of people that want to have real, authentic democratic values in the Democratic Party. They, they are, they're against this war. Um, and then you're going to have the establishment. So what do you see happening in terms of the platform issues and uh, the narrative coming out of Chicago uh, 2024? Well, look, you know what the Democratic establishment is going to do. They're going to say, uh, you know, if we're not able to pull off the McCarthy RFK Jr. strategy in 68 and Biden is still the, the Democratic candidate, they're going to tell everybody, you must obey. It doesn't matter that Joe Biden didn't do 85 percent of what he promised. It doesn't matter that he didn't even uh, do some of the he didn't even propose some of the policies. He said he was for a public option, didn't even propose it. Paid family leaves at 84 percent. He didn't even try. Fifteen dollar minimum wage. He killed himself. He didn't do any of these things. They're going to say it doesn't matter. You must obey. Oh, oh, the war is incredibly unpopular. Oh, uh, people don't want you to murder Palestinians. We don't care. You must obey. And so, a lot of progressives are not going to obey. And and so, I imagine that there'll be some sort of you know political uprising at the convention, and and the establishment will strike back, and they'll say. Uh, you're, you're, they'll do their usual bag of tricks. We don't have to deliver, they'll say. Our candidate can be a miserable failure, not do any of the policies he promised, do policies that are di diametrically opposed to the Democratic agenda, be in favor of endless wars, be in favor of war crimes. He has no obligation, they'll say. But you have an obligation to obey him and to do everything that he commands you to do. No deal. So let's see what no deal looks like in Chicago. Well, there was another important person, uh, leader at the Democratic National Convention in 1968. His name was Julian Bond, uh, and he actually ended up uh, 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 as a vice presidential candidate. Uh, I see you uh, in the in the same way, uh, Jenk. Uh, do you see yourself getting to the floor and getting votes uh, to be a, a vice presidential candidate uh, if, if they're going to continue to block you? Yeah. So uh, that's right. Julian Bond was uh, nominated uh, a, as a vice presidential candidate. He got and he got uh, that movement got airtime overall to make their case to the country, which was terrific, which is something that we need to do again in this case. Uh, and, and Julian Bond got that even though he was under 35 years old, he was still nominated and it still became a real issue. And look, I, I'm super lucky. Uh, Julian Bond is not only one of my heroes, but Later in his life, he wound up uh, becoming a friend of mine, and we had him on the Young Turks, and and then we developed a personal relationship, and, and I love that brother, uh, and and he he was one of the critical, not just in that situation, but in so many of the organizing behind the scenes. It was Julian Bond, Martin Luther King Jr., and Bayard Rustin, and 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 there were of course other important uh, players, but those three three constantly stood out. So having him as a role model uh, in that convention is terrific and we will be using that analogy and of course mainstream media is going to want to shut it out shut it down and help invisibilize us and they and they'll say how dare you try to speak out in a democracy remember democracy is on the line um so i'm going to the, the reason why i drive them crazy salam is because i point out their hypocrisies and the arguments i make as you see here are totally irrefutable they're based on nothing but facts so I could show you polling that uh, backs up every single thing I say. I could show you history and reality that backs up everything I say. So the the way that you defeat Trump is not by saying we're going to take very unpopular policies and a very unpopular candidate, and we're going to try to force half our party to obey him. It is the world's worst political strategy. Democratic leadership is totally clueless. They have no idea what they're doing. Running a guy who's 19 points lower than when he barely, barely what 19 points lower. It's insanity. Total insanity. Jenkforamerica.com. Let's get a strong challenge to Biden so we can get a different candidate. It's not too late. We can still make it happen. And 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 honestly, Slam, for my purposes, every day that I'm in the campaign, all the way through to the convention, is a day that we get to have a voice speaking out on behalf of not just us as a community, but on behalf of logic, reason, humanity, and decency. So everyone who helps make that happen, I can't thank them enough. Well, Cenk Weger, um, I think 
you are a courageous and clairvoyant voice for all of us, for all Americans. I uh, really appreciate your analysis uh, and uh, your clarity in describing the challenges that is that are uh, facing all of us as, as Americans and, and a way to move forward and being true uh, to our values as uh, democratic values as Americans. Uh, you're, you're a tremendous leader and individual, and we really, really value the time we, we were able to spend with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you.